This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We now move away from the section of the syllabus that dealt with uh, strategy and on to the section of the syllabus which deals with risk. Uh, and first of all, we need uh, some definitions. Uh, risk is a condition uh, in which there is a quantifiable dispersion of the possible outcomes. So quantifiable. In other words, if you're dealing with risk, strictly speaking, you can attach probabilities uh, to what's going to happen. So if you're developing a new product, uh, the new product could either sell well or could sell badly. Uh, if you can say, well, I think it's going to sell well, <coughs> excuse me, with a probability of 0 0.7 and badly with a probability of 0 0.3, then you are in the area of risk. So quantifiable dispersion. And of course, there are different possible outcomes, success, failure, high cost, low cost, high sales, low sales, and so on. Uncertainty. Uh, is really where you don't have the quantifiable probability statistics. You know that things could go bad or could go well, uh, but we haven't got any information about the relative likelihood of them going bad or going well. We're working much more in the dark. Insurance companies work with risk. So insurance companies have all sorts of statistics uh, about the chance of a 30-year-old male having a car accident uh, compared maybe to the, the chance of a 40-year-old a, a female and, and so on. And of course, they and also based on your driving record and so on, uh, they uh, have a risk figure in mind uh, which is going to determine your insurance premium. Similarly, so life assurance, they have all sorts of statistics uh, about the if somebody is 50 years old, uh, the probability that they're going to be, uh, you know, alive in say 25 years or 30 years or 35 years, and it depends on uh, male, female, or depends on maybe uh, uh, previous health issues that they would have. It de depends on where they live and and, and so on. Uh, but they got this really detailed information about the probabilities of survival, uh, and again they can uh, use that to determine. Uh, life assurance premiums or, or pension annuities and the like. When we come to really uh, consider the, the almost the impact of risk, uh, it, it is really got, got two components to it. There is a probability that the event will happen, and then there is the consequence uh, or the consequences that take place if it does happen. So the two kind of uh, areas we'll be looking at, the, or, or, or we can look at, is you could have a, a, an event which is very unlikely, uh, uh, and if the consequences were quite severe, you might decide to put up with it. Uh, so, you know, when you're crossing a road, there is a chance that you will be knocked down, and the, the uh, consequences are very severe, but in your own mind, you're doing a little kind of calculation and say, well, I could be killed crossing the road, but actually the probability of me being killed crossing the road is, is terribly small, and we, you know, we cross the road multiple times a day. Or uh, there could be a high probability of something happening, uh, and the consequences are relatively small. So a uh, high probability maybe of uh, something happening uh, is that, uh, you know, when you're uh, washing up a, a cup or something, uh, maybe you drop it or you chip it on the tap. Uh, but but by and large, it's a fairly trivial event, and we just don't kind of worry about that. Where we get particularly worried is where there's high probability and high consequences. Uh, so we know there's a high probability of the event occurring, uh, and in particular, the consequences are going to be very bad, then we become maybe quite wary about that. So many people will, for example, maybe not undertake any sort of um, adventure sports or dangerous sports, uh, because, you know, if I begin, they, in their own mind, of course, we've got different perceptions of risk. If I begin uh, skydiving or rock climbing or something, 
there is a substantial risk I'm going to fall. And if I do fall, then the consequences could be severe. Uh, and so they avoid it. Other people have got quite a different perception of what the risks might do. And of course, <coughs> and of course, something that's very important in risk is you can often control it. So in rock climbing, you essentially control the risk uh, or can control it by using ropes and the like. And you bring the risk down to maybe something which is acceptable. Some more little bits of uh, terminology. Downside risk is a possibility of uh, a loss. And, and if there is no possibility of any gain, if there's only loss, then really it is pure risk. Uh, so pure risk is you know, coming from a fire. So a fire in your home, a fire in your office, no good things are going to come from that. It is pure risk. It is certainly downside risk. Uh, another example would be a virus. Uh, it could be a virus in, in, in your body, but I'm talking about a computer virus. Uh, there's really no good news about getting a computer virus, and that risk is pure risk. It is all downside. Upside risk is a possibility of a gain. And of course, the, the upside risk, the possibility of a gain, is perhaps when you get a, a new product. We launch a new product, uh, with the hope that it will sell well and make us a gain. Of course, we're not certain, and by far the most common uh, form of risk is a speculative risk, where things can go both ways. So if you invest in shares, they could go up or go down. If you change money into foreign currency, it can get more valuable, less valuable. If you launch a new product, it could go well, it could go badly, and, and, and so on. So most risk we'll come across is going to be speculative risk. And we talk about risk, we tend to think of only downside risk. We, we focus on, on the bad things. But strictly speaking, risk is a, usually a two-way street. Risk will take into account also the uh, possibility of things going well. What we're doing in business or almost any activity is really balancing risk and I suppose return. If in business certainly you take no risks whatsoever, uh, you don't develop any new products, you don't try to go into any new countries and so on, then you're not going to make much of a profit. Uh, if you're not going to take any risk whatsoever about anything you can do commercially, is maybe put your money in a very safe bank account uh, and just earn uh, very small amounts of interest. But most companies uh, want to, to develop products, develop markets and gain customers and so on. And if they're going to do that, they have to incur some risk. You have to take the risk of uh, deciding maybe to open in America. It mightn't work, but if it does work, then of course we've got a vast uh, population uh, who could provide new customers to us. However, this uh, almost requirement, uh, and it's almost a, a natural activity of entrepreneurs to want to take risk, uh, has to be kept within bounds. There has to be conformance. Uh, that we don't want the company to be taking, if you like, outrageous risks. Uh, uh, undertaking projects which, if they fail, could lead to the end of the company. So we have this balance between what's called performance, taking a risk in the hope we're going to get better profits, and conformance. Uh, conformance that we kind of control uh, people's risk-taking, uh, that we mitigate it, that we stop spending more money in a project if it seems to be irredeemably bad, and so on. And uh, compliance with the rules and regulations to limit the risk is necessary. But generally speaking, higher risks are going to be needed to uh, produce higher returns. And a lot of the argument is about how much higher should those risks be. Uh, and there is no single answer to that. What we can do uh, uh, here uh, is, is look at the uh, the risks we might undertake, look at the 
competitive advantage of the return, the possibility of increased profits, if, if you like. And some things are routine. We're not going to get much extra profit, uh, but it's not going to be much extra risk. So it could be signing up a, a small new customer and giving him a small credit limit. So they're not going to buy very much from us at the start. Uh, there's a risk that uh, they don't pay us. Uh, but of course, if we put a credit limit on that, that's the compliance bit of it, uh, then the risk that they go bad is low. Uh, and even if they do go bad, we're not going to lose that, that much. If it's high and high, we're going to avoid it. A big one, if it's high risk but low return, then it's obviously something to avoid. So if we were thinking uh, maybe we should develop a new product, but actually the market for that new product is very small, why would we undertake this high risk that the development of the product might fail if at the end of the day it's only going to sell you know, a few hundred units a year and the extra profit is going to be trivial? You probably decide not to even start developing that product. If we're high and high, so maybe developing a new product, uh, but now if it comes off, there's going to be a vast new market uh, and a really high return or increase in our competitive advantage. That's what we need to look at carefully. That's where we really come up against the, the balancing which is going on here. Uh, high risk, we spend a lot of money up front, but you know we might have to write it off because it doesn't work. But on the other hand, uh, there, there are perhaps riches at the end of the day. And this is the sort of thing where, you know, there, there are certain strategies that uh, maybe we say, well, after a year, let's see how the project is going. If it seems to be on stream, if the costs seem to be controlled, if it seems to be technically feasible, we'll go on with it. Uh, but if at the end of the year, when we review the project, then maybe that's when we're going to decide to, to, to pull the rug and, and not to do anything more with it. This is uh, great. Uh, this is a kind of no-brainer. There's low risk and the possibility of high return. Then we're going to go for that. So if, uh, for example, a distributor in a foreign country said, look, our population really wants your product. Uh, why don't you export your product to me? All you have to do is sell it to me. Uh, I will look after all the distribution and marketing in my own country because I know about that. And then you're into probably this, this almost golden quadrant here. There's relatively low risk. Uh, you, you can maybe take out credit insurance. You can make sure maybe you're even paid in advance by this overseas agent. Uh, so you're not exposed very much to risk, but the overseas market, uh, particularly when dealt with by this agent who knows what they're doing, uh, it could really bring on a very, very high extra returns, extra profits, and you definitely go for that. The risks are uh, categorized into really four uh, types. The first two are going to be strategic and uh, operational risks. And the first uh, one we've got here are strategic risks. And, and think of what we always said about strategy, it's kind of long term. And a, strate a strategic risk is really going wrong in the long term, making sort of rather fundamental errors, uh, perhaps in our decisions or rather fundamental things happening in the market. And an example maybe of a company which has suffered from a strategic risk, uh, what we, uh, the company we mentioned right at the start of the, the kind of lectures, uh, Nokia. So Nokia did very well. Uh, but then uh, essentially the long-term technology changed. People went for smartphones and, and so on. Uh, and Nokia didn't alter its uh, position in the market quickly enough. Uh, Kodak was another one of a strategic risk. Suddenly the product that was our breadwinner and a very profitable product, nobody wanted it anymore. What can cause it? It can be reliance on outdated technology, maybe like uh, Kodak. Competitor action, maybe a competitor suddenly develops a better product and we're kind of left standing. Reliance on a declining market, or maybe we have uh, 
too much of our operations in a declining country, a uh, country which has gone into economic recession and so on, uh, and really eats into our profitability. Reputational risk over perhaps a number of years has been a few scandals, uh, and people are going to look at us and say, well, they did that wrong in that year, the next year they did that wrong. Uh, what else is, is going to kind of skeleton to come out of the the, the closet and so on. Uh, I, I just don't trust those people anymore. And I suppose we could think uh, maybe of Volkswagen. Fantastic reputation. And then uh, there was a scandal about misreporting emissions from particularly the diesel cars, but also, also other cars. Uh, and suddenly, you know, they were at great reputational risk. They seem to have done okay, uh, but it was very expensive for them. And perhaps financial risks, you borrow too much, uh, your interest burden is too great, your profits fall a little bit, uh, and suddenly you can't pay the interest and you're in trouble. Operational risks are much shorter term risks, they're almost day to day things that go wrong. So examples could be human error, somebody pressing the wrong button on a machine or uh, deleting important files in a computer. Uh, those are operational risks. A machine breaking down, so it begins producing products which are faulty, that is uh, an operational risk. Fraud, non-compliance with regulations, probably an operational risk if it's just a slip. It could be a strategic risk if there was a, a, a deliberate policy from the top to try to deceive government and regulators. Loss of key people, uh, uh, the occasional debt going bad uh, are kind of operational risks uh, which we have to really cope with. And then we have uh, reporting risks, the reliability of reporting. Uh, there is a risk that our financial statements is wrong. Uh, there is a risk that if you have to send in returns to the government, maybe about employment or something of that sort, you get that sort of information wrong and so on. I would say that by and large of the four kind of risk categories we're going to be talking about, uh, probably reporting risk is it's going to be embarrassing, but it's probably going to be the cheapest, probably. And finally, there is compliance risk. Compliance is where you fail to comply with rules and regulations. And this can be uh, very, very expensive. There can be fines. And sometimes governments put, put on what's called punitive fines. Uh, the fines are very, very high to punish you and to act as a deterrent for others. There can be damages. So if you don't comply with health and safety regulations and one of your workforce gets badly injured, then you're going to have to pay that person damages. And then sometimes there can be, uh, you can actually lose your license. So in, in the UK, as in most uh, uh, countries, uh, our restaurants are uh, inspected uh, to ensure that they comply with uh, basically food hygiene uh, regulations. Uh, and if an inspector goes in and finds that the, the kitchen is disgusting, really, uh, then the uh, regulatory authorities can ban the restaurant from trading. And can either ban it from trading until it cleans stuff up, or if it keeps repeating it, can ban them permanently from trading and so on. So potentially very, very s severe penalties. All we have in the next few slides, and indeed in the notes, is just a, a big list of potential risks. You don't have to learn what these are. It's just showing you that there are many, many different forms of risks. So an environmental risk could be that you release uh, nasty stuff into the river, and probably then uh, triggering a kind of a, a regulatory uh, problem. Economic risk that maybe the exchange rate moves against you and you find it hard to export or you find the imports are very expensive. 
going further on down uh, uh, here, uh, we have uh, financial risk coming in, currencies changing, interest rates changing, uh, and, and the like. Uh, loads of IT risks, viruses, hacking, the machine simply breaking down and you're not being able to trade for several days because uh, a programmer has made an error in the updates. Uh, knowledge management, uh, that uh, a, some key personnel leave and when they leave they take with them knowledge which is very important to the business and the business is left bereft. Property risks. Obviously the property could burn down, it could be flooded, those are property risks. But it could also be that you have bought property and been trading uh, with it for some years, uh, maybe a shop, and then you find that the area of the town which the shop is situated has become unfashionable, or people now feel it's, it's a bit dangerous to go to that area of the town, and you're left with this property <coughs> which is kind of in the wrong place. Uh, and there's a risk, therefore, that it's not going to be really earning its keep. Other ones here, just a couple of these. Health and safety risks I've talked about already, having to pay damages and so on. A trading risk, uh, perhaps that a major customer takes uh, business somewhere else. You could also bring in their bad, bad debt risk. The categorization doesn't matter very much. Resource risks, you find it difficult to find enough raw materials uh, because the raw materials are you know, very difficult to find or maybe the country uh, that produces them is going through some sort of political turmoil. Uh, fraud risks uh, that your staff are stealing from you uh, basically. Probity risks that your staff maybe uh, have embarked on uh, providing maybe bribes the customers uh, to get big orders coming in. Uh, and of course, when the, the bribery is discovered, uh, again, you're going to be in for huge uh, penalties, potentially. Now, almost getting back to this conformance performance balance that we've got uh, here, uh, a very important concept, and what you have to understand, really, is risk appetite. And as it says here, risk appetite it's the nature and strength of the risk that we are willing to bear. Some organizations are risk-seeking and some are risk-averse. Uh, and it isn't that one is right and one is wrong. Uh, what's particularly important is that they don't tell lies to their shareholders. So if you say to your shareholders, we are a company uh, which, which takes risks, you know, inevitably our business is going to be one where we take risk. We are developing pharmaceuticals, we pump millions of dollars into this and then maybe find it's not going to work. It could be a bit of a bumpy ride. Uh, and provided the shareholders are happy with that, that's fine. Other companies will say, we're a really safe home for your money. Uh, we will uh, maybe be in a food distribution supermarket company. Uh, supermarket companies tend to give fairly stable earnings because everyone needs to eat and so on. Uh, and they, provided they, they stay true to that, they just stay in the supermarket business, they don't start diversifying in, into other risky areas, then that is fine as well. The two things that make up the risk appetite, how much risk are we willing to bear, basically, uh, I'll do the second one first. It is risk capacity. Uh, the nature and strength of the risk that the organization is able to bear. For example, uh, what are its cash resources? If you have lots and lots of money in the bank, and you embark on some sort of speculative development of a new product, and the new product doesn't work, okay, you've spent a lot of money, but nevertheless, you're not going to go into liquidation because you still have lots and lots of money in the bank. You have almost the flexibility to gamble safely. 
If, however, you've got, for example, relatively little money in the bank and you embarked on a, a big project uh, and the big project fails, uh, then that could be the end of you because you've, you've kind of bet the company, really, on this project working. And it could be exactly the, the same project in both situations, but in the, the well-off company, it can stand to lose that money. In the less well-off company, it's going to be a really dealt a fatal blow if it loses that money. So it's risk capacity. And secondly, uh, you have the risk attitude. Uh, the director's views, uh, and ideally these views here, uh, should reflect the shareholders. The director's views of the amount of risk that the shareholders and they think the shareholders are willing to bear. So you could have a company with lots of money in the bank. It could kind of gamble on your project safely, but actually the shareholders don't want that. The shareholders want a nice, safe home for their savings. Alternatively, you could have a company with lots of money in the bank and the shareholders kind of don't want that. They, they, they say, well, you have to go out, you have to push the boat out, you have to try to develop new products. I want to see growth and I'm willing to undertake a bit of a loss. You know, that's what it takes. So the two things are, is how much can we afford to lose? And secondly, really, what is the risk attitude uh, of the directors? But ultimately, that should be reflecting the risk attitude of the shareholders, the people who own a company. Benefits of risk management is going to be, first of all, more predictable cash flows. Uh, if you uh, give your credit limits, for example, uh, to customers and one of them goes bust, then you've limited the damage. The cash flow is going to be a bit adverse but it's not going to be deadly adverse, uh, if, if you like. Uh, if instead of maybe opening a hundred branches in a new country at once, uh, you open 10 branches, see how they go. They go well, then you extend your uh, 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 operations in that new country. Uh, again, you are having more predictable cash flows, uh, particularly if there's downside risk. It implies well-run systems because somebody has sat back and thought about risk and thought about cash flows, thought about the upside and the downside that might come through. If you don't have any form of risk management, it's almost as though people go into projects or ventures without probably really thinking about them and evaluating them properly. Limitation of the impact of disaster. So, uh, a, a risk management, a, a, you know, a very simple, obvious one, is sort of smoke detectors. Uh, a, a very simple one is if you're reliant on your computer, a standard risk management technique, apart from keeping that computer secure, is of another computer, probably in a different town, mirroring the records on your main computer. So, if one goes down, gets damaged, the other one just kind of starts off immediately, seamlessly, and trading continues. Greater confidence amongst almost everyone involved with the organization, investors, employees, customers, suppliers, and partners, and so on, are here. And there's greater uh, confidence here if you believe that the risk is down, then this is going to, uh, should uh, say, well, my costs are going to be down. But I'm not going to lose as much unexpectedly. I'm not going to come in for fines and, 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 and damages and so on from uh, uh, people. I've got some more, more predictable kind of cash flows. And what you should find here is your cost of capital is down. So when you go to the bank and uh, want to negotiate an overdraft or a loan, one of the things they will think to themselves is, is this a risky place to lend money to? And if you can show that you are managing your risks well, that the chances of something 
big and nasty happening uh, unexpectedly is low that you'll therefore nearly always be able to pay the interest uh, then the bank will lend you the money to lower rate similarly if you're going to people and asking for share capital uh, if you can say well look you know we're very cautious we're taking some risks uh, but nothing really nasty is going to happen and with those risks we'll be able to nicely increase our dividends and so on uh, then people will be willing to invest in you uh, more readily and more cheaply than they will uh, invest in a, in a company where the earnings are very erratic uh, where the track record is very lumpy and so on dividends kind of going up and down and company in the headlines uh, for, for doing things wrong and so on the lower the cost of capital then the higher the share price should be. The share price will be up and the present value of any project should also be increased. And finally, better matching of the risk appetite of the shareholders to what the company is actually doing. You need to be fair to shareholders. You need to say, look, if you invest in us, this is a sort of company we are, these are the sort of risks we undertake, these are the sort of safeguards maybe we put in to make sure we don't lose too much money. Are you interested in investing in a company with that sort of risk profile? What we don't want to be doing is, is kind of luring shareholders into a company and then them finding it's really not the type of risk return balance that they're going to be happy with. And we have to find this acceptable risk uh, balance between risk and return.